Well, hello there, and welcome to a special edition of Telil 24-7. I'm your host, Adam Cook. We're coming up on the two-year anniversary of the election of the Tim Houston Progressive Conservative government here in Nova Scotia. So we thought this was a good time to check in with Nova Scotia's three major political party leaders. On a future edition of Tell Hill 24-7, you're going to hear from Claudia Chender, the NDP leader for Nova Scotia. And this week, we have two of the three major party leaders for our province. In just a few minutes' time, you're going to hear from Zach Churchill, the leader of the official opposition and the leader of Nova Scotia's Liberal Party. But to begin, we are pleased to have our first ever Talil Studio interview with Nova Scotia Premier and PC leader Tim Houston. Here's our conversation in the Talil Community Television Studios in Arishat right now. And we are pleased to welcome, through the latest stop on a big swing through Cape Breton during the last week of June, Nova Scotia's Premier makes his debut here at Talil Community <laughs> Television. Tim Houston is here. Premier Houston, thank you for joining me today. Happy to be here. Happy to make my debut here on, on site, for sure. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here at our Arishat Studios. And you are just literally minutes before we sat down here, coming from Strait of Cancel yeah. Superport Days at the Dundee Resort. And that's where you were giving the lunchtime keynote address. What was the atmosphere like there for you, and uh, how did you feel as you were letting people know what was going on? Yeah, so first off, happy, always happy to be in the, in the area, and Dundee Resort is an amazing, amazing uh, venue for uh, an event like that. It was a full house. The energy is incredible. There, there's so much going on in this region, so much potential for our province in general in the energy space, in the green hydrogen space, and, and a lot of it's being led right, from, right from, from this area of the province. So the energy was high, actually. It was great. It was a great crowd. Now, I want to pick up with you about green hydrogen and green ammonia because we are at a point now where we have two companies that have received environmental assessment to get going in western Richmond County, Bearhead Energy and Everwind Fuels, Port Hawkesbury Paper also getting approval for a smaller green hydrogen development in the same area. Your government closed several loopholes and filled in several blanks in existing legislation to make it easier for green hydrogen to set up on an individual basis over the course of the fall. Can you tell me a little bit about why that was a priority and why you've mentioned the straight area so much in terms of looking at green hydrogen? Yeah, just the potential is so great. I mean, if you think about the uh, the wind speeds we have here, world-class wind speeds, uh, offshore wind speeds, onshore wind speeds, um, the province in general, the tidal potential we have is just, it's just remarkable. There's so many jurisdictions that are envious of what we have. And we have it right here. Um, so we need to we need to act on that that opportunity. So our government is you know we, we're we're a government that's very focused on action. We want to move things forward uh, in in a responsible way for sure. But uh, I find a lot of times uh, governments are you know they 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 don't want to say yes, but they don't want to say no. So they say maybe, and maybe in government speak means more studies, more studies, more you know. So so we we want to get to the yes or get to the no. You know, some projects are appropriate and some aren't. So let's get to yes or let's get to no. So we're moving quick and we have so many partners here. You know, the municipality has been great, uh, real, showing real leadership on, on that file. We like to work with those who, who, are, who also have, you know, showing interest in, in moving their own community forward. We, help, we like to help them and work with them. So we're finding that in this region, but the potential is so great. It's the time for this province is right now to act on these things. And the world is looking for green energy and we can be providing it to them, so we should. Now talking about local leadership, mm. the last time I got to interview you was almost mm. three years ago actually, on the deck of the St. Peter's Marina. You were relatively new to the position. You had become the PC party leader in 2018. You were with the newly minted candidate for I Richmond was, at yeah. the time, Trevor Woodrow. He of course is now nearing his second anniversary <laughs> as being the Richmond MLA. What has it been like working with him and having him in caucus? Look, we have a, we have a great team uh, across the province, but uh, Trevor Boudreau is uh, the leader Leadership that he shows at the at the caucus table, he represents this community so well. And you're right, I was a new newly uh, elected leader at that time. And actually, as we as we started to plan and prepare for that provincial election that ultimately came in 2021, Trevor Boudreau was the first candidate elected under as me as a new leader. So we have a have a special special bond. But uh, look, he's a great person. He cares about the community and uh, puts a lot in uh, to represent in the community and and comes to Halifax. And when he comes to Halifax, we we listen. 
to him. Mm -hmm. I listen carefully to what he has to say on the issues because I know he's, 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 he's sharing what he's hearing from people. Uh, and that's, that's, what, that's what government can never lose sight. Politics is about people, uh, and, and Trevor's a great representative. He really is. Now, as you mentioned, we're coming on the two-year anniversary of not only the election of Trevor Boudreaux, but of course the election of yourself as the Premier and the PC party as the government party. As we head towards the midway point of this first term for you, I'm just wondering how do you feel in terms of the party's performance and your own performance as Premier? Are you where you want to be right now? Yeah, so two years, eh, already? Yep. <laughs> but uh, look, I think, you know, um, I'm an impatient person by nature. We always want more. We always want to go faster. Uh, Nova Scotians have a right to expect uh, a sense of urgency from their government. So we move, we're moving quickly. But the challenges that we face in this, in this province are, are real. In healthcare, uh, for sure. Uh, I do, I do believe, uh, I'm, I guess I'm optimistic when I talk to many healthcare workers I talk to are, they're hopeful. And they're optimistic, and they can see that you know it takes time, but it's it's coming. So, you know, we're very focused on healthcare for sure. We'll continue to be focused on that. There's a lot more work to be do, but uh, to be done. But I do feel like we're we're, we're moving the needle. So that that's good. Uh, but the the province is growing. The population is growing at an incredible uh, incredible pace. I mean, we had the year over year numbers uh, thirty seven thousand new Nova Scotians, that's incredible. We would normally grow by about 5,000 people. So when you think about that type of growth, uh, even, in, even in the last 18 months, uh, 50,000 new Nova Scotians, 50,000 in 18 months, that's like adding a Sydney and a Truro and a Wolfville all in that amount of time. So uh, this is good. Uh, uh, people drive economies, people create opportunities, so the growth is good. It's not without its challenges. Challenges in, in housing, as we said, challenges in healthcare as well. But, uh, but I think what, what I would say overall, uh, two, years, two years into this term, um, just as a Nova Scotian, I'm proud of uh, the potential of this province and I'm proud of the fact that we're acting on that potential in so many ways. It's a great province. It's an incredible province. There's a lot good happening. There are challenges for sure, but there is a lot good happening in this province. Now, I want to pick up on health care for a couple of reasons. You made that the centerpiece of your 2021 election campaign. It's still been a centerpiece of the way that you and your government have proceeded since being elected in August of 2021. This morning, you and MLA Boudreau got the chance to give a, get a little visit to the Straight Richmond Hospital in yeah. Evanston. That's been a spot that has had its struggles, that has its struggles keeping the ER open. A year ago, it was not only facing doctor vacancies, but also nursing vacancies. Your government set up an Office of Healthcare Professional Recruitment to try to fill these gaps. How do you feel that that process is going and what did you think of what you saw at the Straight Richmond? Well, I was happy to be there today. It's a great facility and the people working there are, are dedicated to, um, to, to providing good health care. Uh, we, we really have good people working in the health care system in, the, in this province and certainly at, at that hospital 100%. So we know that there's human resource uh, challenges for sure. I think that the biggest step we've taken is just in this session of the legislature, we passed the Patient Access to Care Act. This is a very, very significant piece of uh, legislation. I think in the fullness of time, you know, 10 years, but maybe five years, maybe less, uh, people will look back at that piece of legislation and say, wow, that changed the delivery of healthcare, not only in Nova Scotia, but in Canada, it, it really will. And it's focused on common sense credentialing. So if we have healthcare professionals in, you know, maybe in the UK or, you know, in the States or another part of the world, good, good enough for them, good enough for Nova Scotia. We don't have to make them jump through a number of hurdles and a number of exams. Let's look at their experience, let's look at their training, and let's get them credentialed here where, where appropriate. And this one act is changing things. Uh, the Nurses College in particular, they've shown tremendous leadership on this file, but they identified a few countries where the training is, 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 is as good as ours, in some cases exceed, exceeds ours, but it certainly as good, we can't lower that standard of care. Uh, and since that act came through, um, they had 10,000 uh, nurses, I think it's up to 13,000 nurses from other countries apply and say, we want to be part of the solution in Nova Scotia. So, you know, these things, we'll, we'll, we'll go through those applications, we'll be able to fill a lot of vacancies, we're doing the same uh, for doctors, we'll do it for physiotherapists, pharmacists, all, we have vacancies across the board. But this act, 
is it's it's a moment uh, in time that we will remember as changing healthcare in this province. I feel very confident in that. Uh, so there's uh, there's help for all those healthcare professionals out there. Help is on the way. Uh, thank you for for everything you've done to 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 keep the system going. We know it's been stressful, but uh, I feel very strongly that that help is on the way, and Nova Scotians can feel confident uh, that they'll be able to access the care they need, uh, where they need it, and when they need it. Now, I wanted to pick up on one <clears throat> other initiative that your Minister of Health and Wellness, Michelle Thompson, introduced in mid-June, specifically an incentive program for doctors that are currently practicing in Nova Scotia, that if they take on another 50 patients to their patient load, they'll get a financial assistance of $10,000 plus another $200 for each new patient brought in after that 50 is met. Sometimes patient loads, especially in rural areas, are toppling to the point where we're seeing some people in the eastern region having patients loads that go as high as 3,000, triple the provincial average. What do you say to them in terms of whether $10,000 and then $200 per patient after 50 is going to inspire them to take on more patients? Well, it's, it's probably, that's not the person we want to take on more patients. Uh, like, you know, we, we, need to, we need to find the balance where there is capacity, where there are those uh, physicians who have capacity, this is an incentive for them to maybe, maybe do a little more. Uh, maybe this is a physician who's been working part-time. Maybe it's a physician who, you know, has more time, says, well, look, maybe I will take some more patients on. Maybe it's somebody who has, a, you know, has the capacity in their practice. And we'll work with them on the capacity side. So if we add a nurse to the practice, will that help you, uh, you know, provide better care, or more care to more Nova Scotians? If we add another type of healthcare professional to you, if we help with some of your admin, these are discussions that are happening. And I'm very pleased with the, the progress of discussions with uh, Doctor, Doctors Nova Scotia. But at the end of the day, it's, it, this is a, this is a uh, you know, the fix to healthcare is, is there's many, many parts to it. There's not one fix, there's many parts to it. So we're, we're focused on the many hands aspect. So, the bill that I talked about, the patient access to, access to care, the common sense credentialing, also deals with scope of practice. So people will be familiar with pharmacists being able to do more things. So the pharmacy clinics that we've opened up around the province are an access point for certain people, for certain ailments. Go to the pharmacy. You know, there's been over 5,000 strep tests done in those pharmacies just in the last couple of months. I know where those 5,000 people would have went. They would have went to the emergency department. So it's all about sharing the load and getting, you know, getting people the ability to work to their full scope of practice. And and I'll tell you, the uh, the healthcare leadership team, healthcare professionals, they 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 stop me and they tell me. They say the patient access to care bill making a difference. The pharmacy clinics making a difference. The mobile care cl uh, care clinic that goes around the province and, and shows up in certain communities making a difference. Virtual care making a difference. Not for everything but it's, it's making a difference. And that is also attached to, to clinics around the province. So if people use the virtual care system to access care, many times somebody on the other end will say, look, I think you need to see somebody in person. And then we can refer them to one of our, our clinics and get them in on a pretty, pretty timely basis, right? So, so there's many parts to this. And I, and I think, you know, as we continue to move these forward, many of them were pilot projects, we'll expand them. More, there'll be more pharmacies. There'll be more mobile clinics. There'll be more healthcare professionals that want to come and practice here in this province. But, but the incentive program is just at a point in time, and it's just, you know, that's from, you know, working with Doctors Nova Scotia and saying, if we did this, would this be useful? And for some people, it will be. And there will be some patients that go, on, go off the list and get attached to a doctor because of it. Not all of them, but some will. And there'll be some doctors who just say, I can't, I can't take on anymore. And that's okay, too. All right, we'll hope for the best there. Uh, let's shift gears for a moment, Premier Houston, if I could. We started this conversation talking about green hydrogen and green ammonia, and renewable energy seems to be as much of a hallmark of your government as healthcare reform appears to be, partly because of the measures that you and your Minister of Natural Resources and Renewables, Tory Rushton, have taken, as I said earlier, to clean up the loopholes in existing mm. legislation involving green hydrogen, but also in terms of the approach to such federal moves as carbon pricing taking mm. effect on July the 1st, and as well with the Atlantic Loop project. Yeah. I'd like to begin with carbon pricing, if I could. Your government has repeatedly said that it would rather go with what you describe as being better than a carbon tax. That's mm -hmm. been the catchphrase. Mm -hmm. You've suggested that renewable energy that's already in effect in Nova Scotia and taking effect would do more to be able to assist with 
the battle against climate change than carbon pricing. Can you give me a sense on what you feel Nova Scotia can do to help in this regard and why you feel that's better than carbon taxes? Yeah, so look, we, we, the, our climate is changing. There's no question about that. Our climate is definitely changing. Uh, we see it, you know, in what's happening around. And uh, so we agree with the federal government on that. Um, and there's a role for government in, in preparing and, and taking steps to, you know, preserve the planet. We agree with the federal government on that. Now, the place where we disagree is how you do that. So the federal government thinks that you can do it by uh, putting a carbon tax on, on, on Nova Scotians and uh, on Canadians. And I'll tell you, this, this carbon tax is very punitive. This is penalizing Nova Scotians. It's going to hurt a lot. The increase in the price of gas, the increase in the, in the price of diesel, home heating oil, the increase in the price of everything you know, that has to get moved and transported around. We're going to see it at the cash register. So it will cost Nova Scotians a lot of money. And I don't see the upside to the uh, preserving the planet side because we're a rural province. We have to drive to work. You know, there's very few places in this province where they have the opportunity to say, well, let me jump on public transit. Mm -hmm. You know, very few places where they can say, well, maybe I'll bike to work. Maybe I'll bike to, to take the kids to hockey practice. Maybe I'll, these things, they're just not options. They're just not reality for us. So, so a carbon tax is designed to modify behavior, to get somebody to do less of something. You see that with taxes on things like alcohol and, and, and smokes and stuff, right? Maybe if we put the taxes on, they'll do less of it. So that's what a carbon tax is meant to modify behavior, but we can't. We can't modify our behavior. We have to drive, we have to heat our homes. So therefore, it won't do anything to preserve the planet. Meanwhile, we went to the federal government and say, we, here's an idea. Let's actually focus on steps that are meaningful. Support us while we unlock the potential of offshore wind. Support us while we unlock the potential of green hydrogen. Support us as we uh, focus on tidal energy. Uh, and, and they said, no, we're not going to support you on those things. We want a carbon tax. And I don't get it. It's punitive to Nova Scotians. It's unfair to Nova Scotians. And it doesn't get you to where you need to get to. So I, I, I just... Um, I, I was so hopeful that we could talk to the federal government, talk some common sense into them, um, but it, it wasn't possible. Nova Scotians will be penalized by a carbon tax, and there's no, there's no good reason why. Now, I just wonder, do you <clears throat> regret at all the <clears throat> timing of your government's responses to carbon pricing? And by that, I mean your government first offered this better than a carbon tax package to the federal government less than a week before the August 31st, 2022 mm -hmm. deadline to submit a new proposal. The following spring, i.e. what we're just coming out of right now, mm -hmm. you and the other two Atlantic PC premiers, Mr. Higgs from New Brunswick, Mr. King from PEI, stated that you wanted an emergency meeting. You made mm -hmm. one last pitch for an emergency meeting with the federal government just a week ago. Some might say, to use a hockey analogy, that your government has basically pulled the goalie and is trying to score a goal to tie the game with five seconds left. How do you respond to that? Look, we, we put forward a plan. The plan was the culmination of a number of discussions. I, was actually, I actually thought that they would see how good that plan was and actually have an adult discussion about it. I actually believed that that was what the next step would be. Um, I, 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 I still can't believe how fixated uh, the federal government has been on just taxing people. Uh, but but it, just, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So, look, we put forward a plan. The reality is there was no, the Liberals were committed to a carbon tax. It wouldn't have mattered if, uh, it wouldn't have mattered who presented an alternative, when they presented it. It just wouldn't have mattered. They're fixated on a carbon tax and, and Nova Scotians, Canadians, uh, will pay the price for that. And, and, and there's so much opportunity, and, I, and I think about this, in a country like Canada, uh, with all of our coastlines, in this, in this great, wonderful country, we have the amount of coastline we have, the amount of potential we have offshore, we don't have any offshore wind. Not, not, not one little bit of it, right? How is that, when you have a federal government that talks so much about the climate and the environment and green energy, how is it that there's no uh, offshore wind in this country at all? That is sad, and that's embarrassing. Um, because they've just focused so much on, on, on the carbon tax as a, as a, as a solution, and it's not uh, the only solution. Uh, it's certainly not a good solution for Nova Scotia. Now, I just <coughs> want to make a lateral move here. Uh, the federal government has actually proposed <coughs> rebates to those impacted by the <coughs> carbon tax. Nova Scotians will pay the highest carbon tax in the country. <coughs> Does your government look at anything like, for example, freezing the provincial percentage of gasoline or diesel does it look at providing any kind of rebates or assistance at the provincial level for Nova Scotians impact? So our government here? has been 
very focused on affordability. We, we've taken a number of, of uh, steps to try to make life more affordable for Nova Scotians. <clears throat> we'll continue to do that. Home heating rebate, you know, seniors care grant, child care. We, we, we've focused on affordability in every way we can. But right now, uh, with the carbon tax, which is unnecessary and not helpful, uh, so now if we take a, a step to try and reduce the impact of that, well, that's, that means that I'm reducing my investment in health care. I'm reducing my investment in seniors. I'm reducing my investment in roads. I'm reducing, and I'm doing that to send money to what, to Ottawa? How about Ottawa just not put the carbon tax on so we can continue to invest in health care, continue to invest in roads, continue to invest in seniors? So I don't, uh, look, we'll do what we can to make more life more affordable for, for Nova Scotians. We'll continue to take steps in that, in that regard. But, but, for, but for, the, uh, for, for the Liberal government to force this tax on Nova Scotians and then say, we'll take, it, take the money out of another pocket, they're asking us to reduce our spending in health care. And I think that's unfair and unnecessary. Now, another bone of contention between your government and the federal government concerning energy delivery and renewable energy comes courtesy of the discussions around the Atlantic Loop, which would provide hydroelectric power from Quebec and Labrador to Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, as well as Newfoundland and Labrador. Ottawa confirmed earlier this spring, the infrastructure minister, Dominic LeBlanc, confirmed $4.5 billion towards a $6.8 billion price tag to get the Atlantic Loop up and running. You and your government have stated that's not enough. Your Minister of Natural Resources and Renewables, Tory Rushton, saying Ottawa should be providing more. Why do you feel that this isn't, at the current time, a good deal for Nova Scotia and what can be done to improve it? Yeah, so we, we've, we've taken very direct action. We've legislated climate goals. We're really serious about, you know, um, greening our grid. We're really serious about our environment. We put them in legislation. Not many other jurisdictions have done that. So as we look to our, our goals for 2030 and beyond, the Atlantic Loop is, is, is an option. It's, it's a potential pathway to get towards our goals. Uh, but it can only be a reasonable pathway if it's affordable and makes sense uh, for Nova Scotians. So, and if it's not affordable and doesn't make sense, then we have to find another path. And there are other paths. We can achieve our goals without the loop, but in some ways the, the loop might make it easier if the price was right. The price is not right. Uh, so the federal government has, has talked about a, a $4.5 billion amount. That sounds like a big number. Uh, but when you lay, lay that alongside of, of an overall cost of $6.8 billion or, or $7.5, uh, not so big anymore. And also, it's a loan, so it has to be paid back. So here's my concerns with it. So uh, number one, um, the, the utility has told us that at the deal that is on the table from the federal government, power rates would double. Well, I don't accept that. I'm not going to sign on to something that will double the power rates of Nova Scotians. That's, that's number one. Uh, number two is the, the cost, $6.8 billion, $7.5 billion, whatever. Uh, show me a major mega infrastructure project that hasn't gone over budget by 50% or 100%. We have our own experience here with Muskrat Falls. So what happens if that goes to $10 billion? This could, this could bankrupt our province at the terms that they have on the table. Well, I don't accept that. I'm not going to risk that, uh, our, the financial future of the province. So the numbers don't work um, uh, for, for our province uh, with what's on the table. If the numbers were to work, then we're interested in them, but they don't work. Uh, so that means we have to go another route. That means we'll, we'll achieve our goals uh, without the Atlantic Loop if it's necessary. Uh, to do without the Atlantic Loop, and we'll do that by adding more wind, we'll do that by more solar, the, uh, we'll do that by adding more hydro, we'll do that by made in Nova Scotia solutions. And by the way, all of these things give us more control over our destiny, because the Atlantic Loop, is we're only talking about the cost to build it, then we have to talk about the price that Quebec may charge us for the energy. Uh, and that is a, you know, that could be, that's a whole nother discussion, right? Yeah. A lot is outside of our control on the Atlantic Loop. Uh, and if the numbers don't work, I'm not going to force it. Uh, I would rather go with made in Nova Scotia solutions that would put more in our control and give us more control over the destiny of our, of our, of our great province. So, uh, so, so one last question on this quickly, sure. Premier, and that's the idea <clears throat> that sometimes these issues get tangled up. You've talked about a concern <clears throat> that power rates could go up. Your government introduced legislation this past October that put a 1.8 percent <clears throat> cap on power rate increases by Nova Scotia Power over the following two years. Shortly afterwards, the CEO of Nova Scotia Power's parent company, Amira, Scott Balfour, announced that the company would be backing away from the Atlantic Loop as a result. 
Is there any leeway for your government and for you personally to lobby for Nova Scotia Power to rejoin the Atlantic Loop process? Would that help make things oh, easier? Oh, I, I think I remember he said that, uh, but you know, they, they, they're still at the table. We're still talking to the federal government. They're talking to the, the federal government. New Brunswick uh, Power is talking to the federal government. We're, look, we're, 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 we're a government that listens. Uh, we're, we want to have adult discussions on these topics, and but, but, but there's, there's there certain things we just can't do, and we just can't sign on to a deal that doubles the power rates for, for Nova Scotians. It's, it's it's not a good thing to it's not a good thing to do, and I won't do it. So um, there's lots of precedent where the federal government could do more. Look at Newfoundland; they, they paid almost five billion dollars to support the ratepayers of Newfoundland. So these are the types of discussions we'll continue to have with the federal government. But w w what is on offer right now, although it sounds like a big number. 4.5 billion. It's not a. It's not. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a number that would uh, protect Nova Scotians. One last question for you, Premier. And this is not necessarily about numbers, although there's a number involved. This is about the fixed election day legislation that you and your government introduced shortly after being elected, and you wanted to bring an end to instability in terms of a government being able to call a vote literally any time. Now that being said, the date that was set for the next provincial election was August 21st, 2025, literally four years from the previous one in 2021. Are you worried at all that having an election in the latter stages of summer could disengage people who might normally be looking at the candidates and their platforms and their policies? Any concern there? No, no, there's not. Um, look, um, this was one of the last jurisdictions to have a fixed election date. Every, every government, uh, certainly in, in, the, in the 10 years that I've been in the legislature and, and, and governments way before that, they all campaigned on having a fixed election date and then got in government and thought, maybe, maybe a fixed election date, not so good. Mm -hmm. Maybe I like to keep that, those cards a little closer to my chest. Yeah. We're the first government that said, no, we, we, we'll, we, we're going to have a fixed election date. So we've done that. Um, so now the, the date is it's, it's four years after the election. Nova Scotians like to have their say on how they're governed and they like to do it in, 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 in four-year increments. That, that, that's, that's the way it is. So our job as, as elected officials is to keep people engaged. And that means, you know, I, I think you, do, you, you can keep people engaged by doing what you say. Uh, you know, we, we campaigned on a number of things and we're focused on those things. We're, we're doing what we said. I, I believe very, very firmly we're doing what we said we would do. In some instances where what we said we do is just not going to work, then we're sticking our hand up in the air and saying, can't do that. People may remember my idea to have a non-resident tax on people, right? If famously, uh, yeah, famously, we remember that one. Famously, yes. uh, we, you know, we we said we were going to do that. We campaigned on that. We did it. Started to do it, and then we we Nova Scotia said, "Don't do it." So we we so we we said we're not going to do that. We we had the courage to change course on that. So by doing what you say, I think you can keep people engaged in the political process and just being a good good MLA and being being and connected to the community like like Trevor is here like you know, MLAs across the province being that voice for people that's how people get engaged uh, they'll go they'll go and vote uh, when they're engaged it's our job to keep them engaged and that's a good spot to end it so I want to thank you Premier Houston for giving me a couple of minutes here in the middle of a busy sprint <laughs> through Cape Breton Island it's a pleasure to have you here at Tele Community Television today happy to do it thanks for having me Very All appreciate right. it Tim Houston is the Premier of Nova Scotia we've been speaking to him here at the Tele Community Television studios in Arishat and just as we segue from our interview with Premier Tim Houston to our conversation with opposition leader Zach Churchill, we'd like to remind our viewers that New Democrat leader Claudia Chender will be featured on an upcoming episode of Telil 24-7. Right now, let's welcome the leader of Nova Scotia's official opposition and the leader of the Liberal Party of Nova Scotia for the past year. He is Zach Churchill, a former minister in the Stephen McNeil and Ian Rankin Liberal governments, I sat down with him last week in the Talil studios in Arishat. Here is our interview right now. And we're pleased to welcome to the Talil Community Television Studios here in Arishat, the leader of Nova Scotia's Liberal Party, the MLA for Yarmouth and its various configurations since 2010, and a cabinet minister in many portfolios in the Stephen McNeil and Ian Rankin governments of the 2000s and into early 2021. We're pleased to welcome Zach Churchill to Talil. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's good to have you. You are making a swing through Cape Breton right now. What kinds of things are you looking for and what kind of conversations are you having as you hit Cape Breton Island? Well, we're, we're chatting with, uh, with individuals and stakeholder groups and the issues 
that I'm hearing about here in Cape Breton are pretty consistent with issues that I'm hearing in other parts of the province. People are really concerned about the state of health care right now, uh, the state of our emergency rooms. People cannot find a family doctor at this point in time. And the affordability pressures are really starting to mount on households. And people are struggling to make ends meet more than they were before. Even, even people with two household incomes now, you know, they're counting their pennies a little more than they did before. And with uh, power rates going up, a uh, gas price that's going to be going up soon, along with the other inflationary cost uh, increases, uh, people are feeling the squeeze. Well, we're going to pick up on a number of these issues individually, partly because you have served in the cabinet portfolios that have dealt with a lot of these issues over the years. I want to begin with health care, if I can. You served as the Minister of Health in the Liberal government that ruled until 2021. Now, when your party left power at that point, the wait list for a family doctor in Nova Scotia was roughly 40,000. It's now over 100,000, more than that figure. I want to ask you, first of all, as health minister in the past in a liberal administration, did you see that it could reach this level that we could be really struggling? Did COVID-19 kind of expose the cracks in Nova Scotia's health system? Basically, comparing where you were then overseeing this system, comparing to where we are now, uh, did you see it coming? Well, we've certainly seen the system get a lot worse since the election, since the PCs and the Houston government have taken over. They've spent a lot more money on health care. They're getting more money from the federal government, but we're actually seeing outcomes get worse. So we've seen the amount of people that need a family doctor shoot up in the province from one end of the province to the other. Um, we are seeing ERs close uh, twice the rate as it used to. We're seeing wait times increase for ERs and offloading ambulances. Uh, Cape Breton now has had the highest increase in, in offload times for ambulances in the, whole, in the whole province. So we certainly haven't seen anything get better. And of course, there's some challenges in the healthcare system that every government's going to be dealing with. But I do think one of the challenges the current government has is that they're very focused on the politics of healthcare and not necessarily the outcomes uh, of healthcare. So everything that's being spent, uh, the majority of things that they're doing, I think, are to get headlines, to demonstrate that they're doing work in healthcare, but if you actually look at the facts and figures on the ground and talk to people that are experiencing challenges in our emergency rooms or who don't have a family doctor, you get a very different picture. Now, I wanted to ask you as well, in terms of the various things that the Houston provincial government are doing, just recently it was announced that doctors who increase their patient load by as few as 50 would be getting a bonus of $10,000. So it seems like financial incentives and extra spending have been the direction that this government has taken to try to address the situation. Uh, the Premier and the Finance Minister, Alan McMaster, the MLA for Inverness just next door, have said repeatedly they're prepared to keep putting the province into debt to try to correct this. Do you get the sense though that the funding has to have some direction, and if you were Premier right now, you're hoping to be Premier in a couple of years, what would you be doing differently as opposed to just offering money at the problem? Well, I mean, they're, they're throwing money at the wall and seeing what sticks. And the fact is, is that the, the, the money that they spent have not resulted in returns for Nova Scotia. So we've got uh, more than twice as many people without a family doctor now. We've got more ER closures. We've got longer wait times. And uh, I think until they focus on some key issues and put some money where it is most needed, we're not going to see uh, the changes that we need to see in healthcare. We're going to be we're going to be chasing our tail on it. They've got to focus more on 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 family doctors. You know, this this recent round of temporary incentives, by the way, is I think very reactionary to the fact that the people who need a family doctor has been increasing and they've been bleeding family doctors from the system over the last two years. But uh, a $10,000 incentive isn't going to cut it, I don't think. You know, if you're, if you're going to, and the Premier, I don't think, is very focused on family medicine because he stood up in the legislature and said the days of having a family doctor from when you're born to when you age is over in Nova Scotia. That's on the record. So obviously, they're not really focused on getting people family doctors or on, on family medicine. And I think if they want to get serious about that, and they need to be serious about it because uh, when people have access to a family doctor, they're not going into the emergency rooms and putting more pressure on already strapped emergency rooms for things that aren't emergencies. Uh, and they're able to access primary care in a way that's going to keep them healthier. 
uh, for a longer period of time. And I think to tackle that family, to tackle the family medicine issue where we have doctors leaving family practice, uh, and they're doing it because they can, there's more economic opportunities for them in the system. Uh, we really have to look at the issues that are bothering them. Billing, they, they, they do not get compensated for complex cases for managing people's complex health issues. We have to look at overhead as well. Claire, in my neck of the woods, uh, next to Yarmouth, uh, the municipality has actually stepped in and provided some of the uh, facilities for family doctors to practice. And they are one of the, the best areas in the, in the province for attaching patients to family doctors. So I think if we look at billing, if we look at overhead for family doctors, instead of these one-off temporary financial incentives, we're actually going to start moving the needle in the right direction and getting more people family doctors and taking pressure off the hospitals and helping people be healthier. I want to segue from healthcare into housing by saying that housing is often a reason that it's difficult to attract healthcare professionals, and I know that the Cape Breton South Recruiting for Health Committee has found that, and they are trying to work with the municipality of Richmond County to try to increase housing availability for people that might look to moving to this area. We're just a year removed from a new ER model being set up at the Straight Richmond Hospital in Evanston, uh, the major hospital serving our area because they were unable to not only have doctors in on a regular basis, but also several vacancies in the nursing staff as well. So just wanted to get your thoughts on the idea of the importance of housing, not just for serving ERs, but also for just serving the medical community in general in Nova Scotia. Well, we are in a housing crisis right now. We have uh, you know, less than 1% vacancy rate in the rental market, and we've actually had uh, housing starts, so new houses being built, uh, in Nova Scotia decrease over the last two years. Uh, so this is not only a problem for recruiting medical professionals because they need to find a place to live, uh, but it's also affecting people's health. We're seeing homelessness increase in Nova Scotia and not just in Halifax or, the, or Sydney in the urban areas. We're seeing it happen in rural Nova Scotia now. When people don't have access to affordable housing and have not, do not have access to food, uh, or, or financially stressed. They're actually ending up in the hospitals too. So it's, housing is a health issue and not just from the perspective of having uh, lodgings for medical professionals that we want to recruit, but also with the people that are struggling with finding housing or, or oftentimes finding themselves uh, sick and, and in hospital. And you can talk to emergency room docs and they'll tell you they're seeing uh, folks that are dealing with those challenges, food insecurity, housing, insecurity and financial stress uh, show up in the hospital. So we, we have to have a new strategy for housing. Now speaking of housing and of affordable housing in particular, that is a top priority for the municipal leaders here in Richmond County and neighboring Port Hawkesbury. You'd mentioned that you want your party to have a priority on stimulating housing development, not just in the urban areas and HRM, CBRM, but you also would like to see it happen rurally. What would you and your party do to make that happen? Well, I think the provincial incentives now uh, for development and affordable housing development in particular are really only built for big developers in, in Halifax. If we want to increase affordable housing stock in rural Nova Scotia, we have to open up those grants. So, people, you know, right now, big developers can access up to $50,000 a unit if they're going to keep the, the apartment affordable that they build uh, for up to 10 years. I think that should be opened up to the whole market. So if you want to put a nanny suite in your basement that's going to be affordable, why can't you access uh, that sort of government incentive to build affordable housing? Because the fact is, is in rural Nova Scotia, it's a higher risk real estate market usually, and you're not seeing developers build the kind of big scale buildings that, that uh, our population could actually probably uh, sustain right now. So I think we should open up the, those grants, make them available for people who want to put a tiny home on their house, uh, an apartment in their basement or, or reconfigure their house to, to put a, a, another unit in and to keep them affordable, I think, I think that can help. There's some bigger issues though. I mean, we do have to look at zoning regulations. We have to densify where we're building in villages and, and town centers. And uh, we're also gonna have to support the next generation of Nova Scotians coming up who are becoming young professionals because they don't believe they're ever going to be able to afford a home. 
uh, in Nova Scotia. And so we really have to think about, okay, what are the needs of this, this, these group, this group of young professionals coming up who don't think they're going to be able to afford a home in Nova Scotia? That means they might want to leave. Um, how can we support them to make sure they can get into the housing market in a, in a, in a, in a responsible way uh, and uh, help them you know, thrive and live the life they want to live here in Nova Scotia? So there's a number of things I think we have to do. We have to look at home ownership. We have to look at rethinking the incentives to develop affordable housing. And the one thing government also needs to look at is emergency housing for people that are homeless because the private sector is not going to do that. Uh, and, and government needs to, I think, work with the not-for-profit sector to find areas where we can do emergency housing for people that are really stuck and finding themselves living in tents uh, or, or on the street because uh, those people are going to get sick, they're going to end up in the hospital, and they're going to put more pressure on uh, our government services. And uh, if we can help prevent that from happening by giving them shelter even for a brief period of time, I think it can go a long way for, for all of us. While we're talking about affordability, a basic question right now, and we're talking about difficulties for low income and fixed income Nova Scotians. We are on the cusp of the introduction of carbon pricing here in Nova Scotia and carbon pricing that will drive gas prices up by 14 cents a liter and have an impact on home heating oil costs as well too. Your caucus colleague, Fred Tilly from Northside Westmount, sat in this very chair just a couple of weeks ago. We talked to him. He has been referring to the carbon pricing system set to get underway as the Houston carbon tax and the PC carbon tax, going on the premise that when a deadline loomed last August to be able to address this and to provide something differently, it seemed like the PC government waited until the last minute to submit what they described as better than a carbon tax, and it was summarily rejected by the federal government. And we're seeing even just over the past few days, the three Atlantic PC premiers demanding an emergency meeting with the federal government to try to deal with the carbon tax and the federal government, to nobody's surprise, summarily dismissed that. Your thoughts on the way the province is handling well, all this and the impact that it's going to have well, for ordinary Nova Scotians? Pe people don't realize this, but we've had carbon pricing in Nova Scotia for four years now. Under Stephen McNeil, uh, the provincial liberal government fought back against the carbon tax and negotiated a cap and trade system so that we priced carbon because we do have to price pollution. We're seeing the impacts of climate change even just this last year in Nova Scotia with Hurricane Fiona with uh, the wildfires that we had in Halifax and the largest wildfire ever in our province's history in, in Shelburne County. Uh, we're experiencing it with uh, lobsters that are migrating out of the warmer waters and, and moving north. And it's going to have profound impacts on our economy, on our lifestyle, on our safety. Uh, but how we price carbon really matters. So the provincial Liberal Party has taken the position that a cap and trade system is the best for the province because we can uh, price carbon with the biggest polluters, uh, raise money to bring in green initiatives, and keep the price off the pumps. And so that cap and trade system resulted in a carbon pricing regime that did our part to combat climate change, that raised money for green energy and renewable, uh, another renewable economy, but also made sure that the price of the pump increase was only one, one cent per liter for four years. Tim Houston not only uh, did, did not negotiate an, an alternative to the carbon tax that's coming, he actually scrapped cap and trade, the legislation uh, that, that brought in cap and trade, without, without a viable alternative. That was a mistake because now we're going to have the biggest increase in gas prices in the whole country. And I think he did that because it's going to be very easy to attack liberals over this because the federal uh, government's brought in carbon pricing. But he really has some responsibility here because he scrapped the pricing, the carbon pricing regime that we had, did not have an alternative for carbon pricing. His alternative plan was just to list a bunch of renewable energy sources that he was going to pursue. Uh, hydrogen, um, offshore wind, and tidal, all of which are in conceptual phases right now. They're not ready to go. And he, he got rid of the, the cap and trade system without having an alternative. And I think he did it so he could just beat up liberals. And I think the political incentive uh, for him uh, outweighed what his responsibility was to the people here to actually find the right alternative for them so that uh, people, particularly in rural Nova Scotia, who have to drive to get to the grocery store, who have to drive to get to work, who don't have access to uh, robust public transit 
systems uh, to make sure that they weren't going to be hurt by this, but, but they are. And the only thing we've really seen from him is posturing and attack ads against liberals, uh, when really as the premier, I think he has a responsibility to do the work, negotiate a better deal, and think these things through. And uh, unfortunately, uh, that didn't happen. So I, I do think he, is, he has triggered the carbon tax by getting rid of cap and trade without having a viable alternative. Now, your party has offered some short-term incentives for the government to consider to help Nova Scotians through this rise in gas prices and home heating oil, uh, specifically putting a freeze on the provincial portion of gasoline prices, mm -hmm. but also ensuring that there are lunch programs available at schools to be able to provide for children whose families might be struggling right now. And cutting income tax. Exactly, uh, and ending bracket creep as well mm -hmm. too. Now that being said, should your party resume power within the next couple of years or beyond that, there is a 2030 deadline in terms of Nova Scotia getting off coal and dealing with other aspects of renewable energy. Do you feel that you have the leeway as liberal leader and as potentially a liberal premier to reverse any of the things that are coming into effect on July 1st? Well, if, if, if we have an alternative plan that's going to price carbon, I think we can. We can change the regime. Quebec still has a cap and trade system. They, they fought to keep their cap and trade system and they, they renegotiated it. Now, after two years of having a carbon tax, are we going to be able to do that with Ottawa? We don't know. We don't know who's going to be prime minister at the time. We don't know who the governing party is going to be. We're going to have a federal election between now and then. So we'll have to wait and see what, this, what the situation is. But right now, the premier can actually provide some financial relief to Nova Scotians who are struggling. We have some of the highest income taxes in the country. We've had population growth and economic growth for 10 years. We should be looking at uh, reducing people's income tax, keeping more money in their bank accounts and in their pockets. Uh, we should put at least a temporary freeze on the provincial gas tax to help people uh, manage this increase in gas prices and help keep some of that gas price down for them. And that's something that we can afford to do, I think, temporarily. And a school lunch program, uh, our party brought in the breakfast program to Nova Scotia. It supports our, our kids, uh, helps the, those that aren't getting access to good food at home, get a good meal or a snack at school. And we think that needs to be expanded to lunch. And of course, with the price of food going up, that's going to help everybody mm -hmm. uh, in our school system. So Tim Houston failed to negotiate an alternative to the carbon tax. So we are going to have a higher prices at the pumps. It's going to affect everybody. But he does have some opportunities to reduce uh, the cost of living pressures on people by, by giving them more of their taxes back instead of blowing it in failed initiatives. Uh, by freezing the provincial portion of the gas tax and by bringing in a universal school lunch program. And unfortunately, he hasn't moved on any of those things. And I don't think he takes the affordability situation very seriously, unfortunately, for people. One more quick thing I wanted to speak to you about in terms of renewable energy. We're just a few hours removed from your party's environmental and climate change critic, Ian Rankin, releasing a statement on behalf of the party regarding the Premier's recent comments that the province could probably afford to move away from the Atlantic Loop program that would be transversing renewable energy all the way around the Atlantic provinces and Quebec. Four and a half billion dollars put on the table by the federal government to contribute to what's estimated to be a $6.8 billion capital cost. Uh, Premier Houston once again saying that there are other ways of generating renewable energy. So your thoughts on the idea that this project, which had already been in jeopardy with Nova Scotia Power threatening to walk away last fall after the provincial government put a cap on power rates, your concern right now that the program could be left twisting in the wind? Well, people need to understand that uh, the Atlantic Loop is the only renewable project that's ready to go right now that's the most economical for the taxpayers and ratepayers as well. So the Atlantic Loop will help us get off coal more quickly and Im importantly, help us stabilize and reduce over time power rates for Nova Scotians. So the Premier tried to intervene with the power rate increases unsuccessfully. He actually made the situation worse. And now we're going to see a 14% increase in power rates along with a 14 cent a liter increase in, in gas prices. So Nova Scotians are going to be hit with these two uh, increases in, in cost of living, power and, and fuel. And uh, the Premier does not have an alternative to the Atlantic Loop. You know, what he has said is he's pursuing hydrogen 
uh, nuclear um, uh, tidal and uh, offshore wind. Okay, um, that's great, but all of those things are, are conceptual right now. There's no money ready to go to implement them. They're years out from development. And we've got this opportunity now with the Atlantic Loop where there's federal money on the table, where we're sharing the costs with uh, other provinces, and it's going to help us get off expensive uh, coal and get to uh, renewal, a renewable energy source. And that's going to stabilize and reduce power rates over, over time. So he's, again, choosing to fight with Ottawa and uh, choosing you know, politics over people, in my opinion, uh, and instead of doing the work and getting it done, he'd rather be in a fight with the prime minister over this instead of actually saying, okay, there's a lot of value for Nova Scotians here. This is going to hit our renewable targets, but also stabilize and reduce power rates over the long run. And he should uh, you know, work with the federal government and, and uh, get moving with this because there is no viable alternative right now. And people will see that. And we will not hit our renewable targets. And power rates are probably going to keep going up. We have talked about several different issues over the last little bit. I want to wrap this up by coming back to politics, which many people might see as a bit of a dirty word, but you are now coming on your one year anniversary of being the leader of the Liberal Party of Nova Scotia. There seems to be some suggestion with recent polling that the numbers are starting to work in both your favor and the party's. Narrative Research's quarterly report has an eight point gap now between the Houston PCs and your party at 31%, uh, they at 39%, but this is the smallest gap we've seen since the previous election campaign. Do you get the sense that both you as leader and your party are getting some traction? And if that's the case, what do you feel that you and your party have to do to be able to close the gap and be able to present yourself as a real viable alternative government as opposed to simply an opposition party? Uh, well, I, I think we're focused on the issues that matter to people. We're talking about getting people family doctors. And again, a lot more people in Nova Scotia had a family doctor when we were in government. As, as many challenges as we had in healthcare, uh, we, there's, there's more than twice as many people now without a family doctor. And that is in part because of the Houston government's, I think, neglect of the family medicine issue. Um, so we have to be talking about the things that matter. Uh, access to primary care and family medicine. Uh, we're talking about people's health because we're not going to fix our health care system unless we start helping people be healthier. And that means doing early screens for cancer. We have high rate of lung cancer in Nova Scotia. We should be screening for lung cancer early. We should be screening for GI cancers early. We should be screening for cardiovascular issues early because the majority of the money that we're spending in our health care system is in the last three months, unfortunately, of somebody's life. If we can start focusing some more of our money on people's health and preventative measures. It's going to take pressure off the healthcare system. It's also going to help people live longer and be happier and, and healthier. We're also talking about affordability. We think it's time in Nova Scotia to uh, let people keep more of their own money that they're, that they're working for. You know, it, we, we're at a point right now where we can reduce income taxes in Nova Scotia. Uh, and that's going to help people uh, make ends meet who are struggling. It's also going to help have more money in circulation in our economy. And uh, we think it's also related to people's health because when they're financially stressed, it impacts their health in a lot of, uh, in a lot of uh, serious ways. So we have been focused on these issues and it's nice to see the polls move a bit. I think people are starting to see that, well, Premier Houston had a campaign plan for health care. He has not had an actual plan to fix health care in Nova Scotia. In fact, the situation is getting worse. And uh, I think people hopefully in a, uh, a year and a half to two years will be ready for an alternative. And we'll certainly be ready with uh, our plan to run on the right ideas at the right time for the province. Well, there are a lot of moving parts to a discussion like this and to a job such as yours. So we appreciate you taking some time to come in and share your thoughts with us. Zach Churchill, thank you so much for joining me today here at Hill Community Television. Thank you, Adam. Really nice to be here and uh, look forward to coming back. And merci beaucoup and bonjour à tout le monde ici à Richmond. Uh, rien, rien. Okay. Zach Churchill is the leader of the Nova Scotia Liberal Party and the leader of the opposition for Nova Scotia. We're speaking to him right here at our Talil Community Television Studios in Arishat.
And there you have it. That wraps up this week's edition of Teleol 24-7. Thank you for tuning in, and thank you to my interview guests this week, Nova Scotia Premier Tim Houston and Liberal Leader Zach Churchill. A reminder that Teleol will have an interview with New Democrat Leader Claudia Chender coming up on a future edition of the show. If you have any thoughts about what you've seen over the past hour here on Teleol 24-7, or you'd just like to offer suggestions for future editions of the show, I'd love to hear them, you can contact me directly. My phone number is 902-625-8863, and you can reach me by email using the address adamjrcook, cook with an e, at gmail.com. You can also contact Halil Community Television directly with your thoughts and your suggestions. The station phone number in Arishat is 902-226-1928, and the best email address to use is telil at telil.tv. Don't forget to follow Telil on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. And our YouTube channel features every single episode of Telil 24-7, including this one, as well as individual interviews and segments from our shows. And we offer the same service for our sister news program, Roundtable. For now, I'm Adam Cook. Thank you once again for joining me for this special edition of Telil 24-7. I look forward to seeing you again next week with a brand new show. Bye for now.